The rest of us, we are going to be in Philippians chapter 4. So you may notice that we kind of bounced around a little bit, but we um, are now in the home stretch of Philippians. And today we're going to be in verses 10 through 13. And in this is we're going to really focus on um, a verse that is probably one of the most commonly misquoted verses in all of Scripture. It's one of the, those verses that whenever in, in seminary or anywhere we talk about, hey, the importance of context, the importance of reading the scripture in context and not just proof texting and pulling out a verse and then using it for whatever it sounds like in, in our meanings, um, that, that this is one of, this is exhibit A almost always. And so the good thing about as we typically, our, our mode right now is we preach through books of the Bible. That's a common way that we uh, structure our sermon series. And this is one of the reasons why is that we get to look at these passages and verses that maybe ring a bell for us, but we get to look at them in their context. And what we find is, uh, uh, typically what we find is when we look at a verse in its context, and especially one like this one today, we see it as even more amazing and more powerful and more helpful than anything we could have imagined on our own. So let's read Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 10. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Lord, help us to hear what you are saying in your living word. And Lord, let it seep into our minds, into our hearts, and flow out in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So that verse, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I, do you guys remember, I mean, this is dating myself a little bit. Does anybody remember the boxer Evander Holyfield? Yeah, so he had Philippians 4.13 on his trunks. And I remember looking at that as a kid and watching him and being like, I, I looked it up because I'm like, well, what is that? And like, I read this verse and I thought like, wow, I can knock out people through Christ who strengthens me. <laughs> and, I, and I would hear this verse like preached over and over again of that. Like you could do all things. And, and it gets presented as this idea of like whatever's facing you, you can have victory. You can succeed. You can defeat whatever's in front of you because you can do all things through him who strengthens you. And this gets applied in all kinds of strange ways. And for a lot of my life, I applied it in the same way. I thought, if I just had enough faith, then I could do anything that God put in front of me, or anything that was put in front of me. I could defeat any evil, any enemy. I could overcome any obstacle. But that's not what this verse is about. And you see it when you actually read the whole paragraph. You see that what Paul's talking about here is not overcoming some obstacle or accomplishing some goal. What you see him talking about in this paragraph is the ability to be content. So when he says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me, he's talking about being content in all circumstances. And I gotta be honest. That doesn't sound quite as exciting as being like heavyweight champion of the world. Like the idea of being content, like doesn't it sound so much more exciting to say, hey, whatever's put in front of you, you can do it. You can make it happen. You can succeed today. You can accomplish everything that you set your mind to because Christ is with you and he will strengthen you. That sounds so much more exciting than him saying, whatever comes today, you can be content. Except that contentment may be the most elusive and sweetest state of all. When I'm content, I'm thankful. 
When I'm content, I don't worry. When I'm content, I don't compare myself with others or compete with others. Contentment is the state of being satisfied and fulfilled and at peace. And at its core, I think that's what we are all chasing. And my whole life, I have struggled with a lack of contentment. I am wired to want to take the next hill and do something bigger and better and to not settle at all and never slow down. Like I am wired to want more all the time. And so contentment, the state of being satisfied and fulfilled and at peace has always been just out of my grip. It has stolen more joy from my life and tarnished more fruit in the ministry that God has given me than anything. Always thinking there is something better out there, that I should probably live somewhere else or do something else. And it's not just in my life. I have seen a lack of contentment steal joy from people for so long. I've watched people take new jobs, move to new places, find new relationships, all in the pursuit of that elusive desire to be satisfied and fulfilled and at peace. Our lives are often marked with the opposite, with dissatisfaction, with unfulfillment and restlessness, filled with anxiety and worry. Now, some of you can relate to me that you are wired in finding your satisfaction by chasing and acquiring, giving yourself over to the idea that some new circumstance, some new thing, that will make you content. You'll finally be satisfied if you just get that. And when things don't feel satisfying, then surely changing the circumstance, if I could just have this, then I would finally know contentment. And no matter how many times, if you're like me and you're wired in this way, no matter how many times you try and fail, you think this time will be different. This relationship will be different. This job will be different. This home will be different. This city will be different. And yet, it always leaves us empty. Some of you hear that and say, right, That's why I just don't worry about any of those things. And you take a different path towards kind of a faux contentment. And that is to just deaden your desires. As long as as I never want anything, I'll never be disappointed. As long as I just don't think about what I could have or what might be, well, then I'm never going to be disappointed by what I don't have. And so I'm just going to deaden my desires. If I manage my desires, what ends up happening is I, I manage my desires so they're in my control to fulfill. You tracking with me there? I make it so that my desires are so small that I'm confident I can fulfill them. And so it's not really contentment as much as it is just settling. And you're not really satisfied or fulfilled or at peace. You become complacent. See, a lack of desire is not the presence of contentment. What God has for us is something so much more. What God has for us is building in us and wiring in us a desire to want more and more and more and yet also giving us the secret to finding it and be satis- being satisfied and fulfilled and at peace. See, in the world's way, in the flesh's way, you can't have both. You can't desire more and more and more and be at peace and satisfied. You have to choose. You either have to desire and commit yourself to never being satisfied or deaden your desires so that you can be satisfied. But in Christ... He offers something more, that we were made for both. To desire great things and to be satisfied and fulfilled and content. And that's what Paul is talking about here. 
He has found this state of biblical contentment, of desiring great things and being fulfilled and satisfied. He has found that to the point where he can be sitting in a prison cell, unsure of whether he is going to live or die, or if he's ever going to see the people that he loves again, that even there he is satisfied, fulfilled, and at peace. And yet we see it doesn't deaden his desire at all for people. He's learned what does it mean to find true contentment. And he says, I've discovered the secret. I know the secret to being content. Okay, Paul, what's the secret? First of all, I just want to point out, it's interesting that Paul says, not that I am speaking of being in need. Like, how can he say that? He is definitely in need. He is in prison. He is dependent on the generosity of his friends. He is most certainly in need. He even talks to them about, you've been able to revive your concern for me, which means you've finally been able to give gifts and to support me. But to Paul, he is content. He's not speaking of being in need. That's not the point of what he's talking about. Because he's learned that in every situation to be content. And so what is the secret to being in that state? To having passionate desires for something beautiful and for more, and yet being in a state of total satisfaction and fulfillment and peace? That's when he says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Christ. He's the secret. You might be thinking, well, that's not very insightful. I could get that. I got that in Sunday school. So what does it mean that Christ is the secret? Like, what does that mean when he says, this is the secret. The secret is I can handle any of these circumstances through him who strengthens me. In whatever circumstance I am given, I have found the secret of being content, and it is found in Christ. And so how does Christ fulfill us and give us contentment in each of these circumstances? Because look at how he, what he says. He says, I'm not speaking of need for I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So he's saying, I found the secret of being able to handle all of these things, highs and lows throughout our entire life. And it is this, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And so one form of that, he he talks about both these highs and these lows. So there's contentment in abundance. Saying, I found the secret to being content in times of abundance. Now let me ask you, does that sound strange that there would need to be a secret to being content in abundance? Like, doesn't that seem pretty obvious and easy? Like, well, if I'm in a time of abundance, if I have a lot, then won't I necessarily then be content? I don't really need to work hard or to seek Christ to to be content in those circumstances because I have everything that I need. I have an abundance. See, the reality, though, is that those things can never bring contentment because they wear out. Experiences can't bring contentment because they pass. Even things like money or financial security can't bring contentment because it becomes the new norm. And we always find ourselves wanting more. There are many studies that have shown how quickly people get used to a a new level or new standard of living. So like when I was fresh out of college, my first full-time ministry job, I made, uh, I made $25,800 a year. And I thought, I could not imagine more money than that. I legitimately thought, like, what do I ever need? Like, this is amazing. I, I was used to making like $6 an hour. I worked as a camp counselor, like the, our kids that are up there right now, our kids, our graduates, young men and women that are up there counseling at camp, and they figured out their hourly wage, and I think it was right around like $1.37 an hour, something like that. And that's what I was used to making. So all of a sudden, I got the opportunity to work full-time in ministry, and I made plenty. I couldn't imagine making more than that. 
But soon, I thought, well, you know what would be better than $25,800? $30,000. Like, if I just had a little bit more, then I'd have a little bit more breathing room. I'd have a little bit more wiggle room. I'd have a little bit more to just do, just a little bit. Like, I don't, I don't need to, like, go on fancy vacations, but just be able to go out every once in a while. And then pretty soon, once you get to that point, it's, well, then 36,000 starts sounding pretty good. That's all I need. And guess what happens when you get there? And study after study shows that at every point when people first get to a new standard of living, they experience some temporary contentment. They feel like, okay, now things are going fine. But within a certain period of time, that wears off and they realize like, oh, you know what would be better than this? Just a little more. Like John Rockefeller said when somebody asked him, how much money is enough? And he said, just a little more. That's our, that's our posture. And they actually find it's very difficult to go backwards in standard of living or income. And the reason that is, is because abundance does not bring contentment. Making a certain amount of money or having a certain amount of things or having any kind of security will not bring contentment because it will never be enough. Contentment will always be found in just a little more. And we end up experiencing what we see in Ecclesiastes 1. I have seen everything that is done under the sun and behold, all is vanity and a striving after wind. Just chasing wind, trying to catch it. And so how do you get off of that hamster wheel? How do you get out of that cycle of just trying to chase and thinking just a little, a little bit more? How can instead we be satisfied and fulfilled not needing the next thing, not needing that little bit more? And the reality is as long as the abundance is your source of contentment, then it will always fade. But when financial blessing, for example, or any kind of abundance is a gift from the giver, instead of just the gift itself, then things change. See, in Christ, every blessing, every abundance, every gift is satisfying because it is enjoyed as a gift, not as a God. It is a reminder of God's care. It's not the thing that sustains us. There have been many times in, in our lives, like with Lauren and me in our years of ministry, where we have not known how we were going to make it financially around the next corner. The entire time when we planted a church in, in Colorado, we never drew a full-time salary from the church. Our desire was not to do that. And so I would piece together other jobs and just make things work. And, and sometimes we just wouldn't know where that was going to come from. And when our focus was on that lack or on when the gift would come in, when our focus was on, oh good, this job came in, now we're okay, that never led to contentment. But when a new job would come in, I'd get a new project or some new job offer to help um, fill in the gap, and I saw it as a gift of God's provision, then it was satisfying. Then it would put me at peace. Because my hope wasn't in that next job that was coming in. My hope was in the one who provided it for me. And when my hope is in the job, the next job that comes in, or that next amount of money that comes in, then it's fleeting because I never know, I don't trust that money. I don't trust that job. I need another one and another one. But when my hope and my trust is in the one who gave that to me, then I'm content because I know, yeah, he gave us this. He'll provide over here too. See, in Christ, when we face abundance through him who strengthens us, through Christ who strengthens us, then every gift of abundance is a reminder of his incredible care and his love for us. It's not the thing that sustains us. And so in Christ, we are content with the abundance. It, is, it feels like overwhelming generosity to us. See, the secret to being content when things are going well is to receive this blessing from your Father and then to be a conduit of that blessing. 
Because if we receive abundance as this overflowing gift of generosity from God, then the natural overflow of that is to use that blessing to be a blessing to others. If I have plenty, then my contentment will be expressed in my thanksgiving to God for providing my every need and my feeling of his deep love and his care for me. And because I am satisfied and fulfilled and at peace, then it will be expressed in generosity towards others. Do you notice anything about that? Deeper love of God and a deeper love of others? It's the great commandment. It's what Jesus says is the greatest commandment, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. The fruit of contentment, when I am content in abundance, it flows out in my obedience to the great commandment. Worshiping and praising God and thanking him for his good gifts and feeling so overwhelmed by his generosity that it pours out in generosity towards others. See, if my, if my contentment is based on the abundance of my bank account, then when it dips or when it's not enough, or I, I'm afraid it's not going to be there, and I function with kind of a scarcity mentality, and I'm like, yeah, but what if, what if this happens? What if this happens? Like, yes, I'm, I'm really happy that I have this, but, but this fear that it's not enough, when I function like that, then I either resent God for not giving me what I think I need, or I ignore God as I pursue my own contentment and my own strength. I earn a little bit more. I figure out another way to pick up some more hours or do this or do that. But as long as I, if I look at this and I say, I don't have abundance, there's a scarcity here. I'm afraid God isn't going to take care of me. Then I either, like, I either resent him and grow distant from him or I take matters into my own hand. And, and, and when that happens, I will not be generous. It becomes very self-focused. See, when I'm content in my abundance, my focus is on God and others. When I'm lacking contentment in abundance, then my focus is on myself, my ability to keep up the abundance and my ability to hoard it. There are many, I'll give you an example, there are many who wait and say, they wait to tithe or give sacrificially until they're financially stable. It's a really common thing. I just say like, well, once, we're sta- once I get to this place, then I can, I, I really want to get to this financial level because at that point, then I can start giving. I can start being generous. But here's what I've learned. If a person is not generous with $1, they will not be generous with $100,000. Period. I might give one time, but it will always be at the moment where they feel like they have enough. But that moment where you feel like you have enough is so short-lived think about it, whether it's with money or time or energy, have you ever on a Sunday morning felt an overwhelming desire of doing something really radical with your time or your money? Where you thought, I'm going to volunteer for that. Or I'm going to give, you know what, I'm going to give to that. You hear a missionary speak or whatever, you think, you know what, I just got this uh, money from this sale and I'm, I'm going to give like half of that to them. And then later, all of a sudden you start to become more reasonable and it gets a little watered down, a little more, a little more, a little more. If you've experienced that, then you and I are in the same boat because I've definitely experienced that. And what's happening there is in the moment you feel like I've got, oh, I've got enough. Like that first moment where you get that unexpected gift or that unexpected um, sale or that unexpected thing. And all of a sudden I've got all this. So of course, like, yeah, everybody always says that when, when they say, well, if I won the lottery, if I won like a hundred million dollars, I'd give away like half of it. And nobody does. Because the second you have a hundred million dollars, every second after you've gotten your hundred million dollars, that feels smaller and smaller and smaller. It's human nature. But if my contentment during times of abundance is found in Christ and in God, who is the giver of all good gifts, then I see that he is not a God of scarcity. He's the God of abundance. And as he gives, he gives more and more and more. And we become a conduit for that generosity. And if my contentment is based in knowing the giver, then I know, I know his resources are endless. 
So that's what it looks like for Paul to say, when I am in abundance, I am content. I'm not hoarding. I'm not worried. What if it goes away? I am content because as I have, I'm able to give. As I have, I'm able to receive God's blessing. And in that, I can handle times of abundance in Christ who strengthens me. But he says, I also know how to be brought low. I can find contentment in times of need. It's not just in times of abundance, but also in times of need, I can be content. And the secret to that is if, if you're truly content in abundance, then you'll be content in your need. See, for Paul, he bounces back and forth because they're actually the similar situation. Paul says, I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. If your contentment is based on the circumstances, when those go away or the circumstance change, then you, so your contentment goes away too. But when your contentment is found in Christ in abundance, then when need comes, guess what you still have? Christ. So the source of your contentment doesn't change whether you're in times of abundance or times of need. Because Christ is where your contentment is. Lauren and I just got to go away, um, celebrate our 22nd anniversary. Thank you. Great. Okay. <laughs> Glad we're so. They're very excited for us, Lauren. Um, so, so 22 years. Um, one of us is very lucky, and um, we we did one of our favorite things. Our favorite things to do usually when we get away is we love, um, and it's something that a lot of you cannot relate to at all. You think we're crazy. But we want to go to the densely, most densely populated place we can find so that we can just walk around and we basically walk and we eat. Like we walk through an urban neighborhood and we just grab like random things of food like wherever we find interesting things. And that's what we did. And we did it in the paradise of Milwaukee. Right? So that's where, we, that's where we celebrated our anniversary. And it was incredible. But not because Milwaukee is so awesome. And not because they're, they're, some of the places that we wanted to go to, we got there and found out they were closed. Some of the places weren't very good. But the reality was that in that time, all that mattered for me was that Lauren and I were together. We were together in a place where we had none of the regular pressures of our daily life, and we got to just be together. And so my mindset was I just wanted to spend time with her. And at any given moment, whether I'm at a coffee shop that's now closed or I'm having, you know, this, this piece, this, this dinner that's not very good, the question I could ask is, is, is Lauren with me? Are we together? Then I'm content. And if that's true in an, in a, for an anniversary getaway, celebrating an imperfect marriage between two imperfect people, how much more is it true every day of our lives walking in a perfect union with the God who is always faithful to us? That's the source of contentment. That's why Paul says, whether I'm high or low, abundance or in need, my contentment is there because the question he asks is, is Christ with me? Then I'm content. Then I have everything I need to be satisfied and fulfilled and at peace. And he remembers, I think, things like, this is what is behind when Jesus says this in Matthew 6. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to a span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things 
will be added unto you. The secret that Paul has found of facing, con- facing need with contentment is that he knows that his Father in heaven provides all that he needs. And whatever he could want, whatever he could possibly want, he knows the giver of all of those things. And he is a good father. What Jesus is saying is you don't have to worry about those things. He's not chastising us of saying like, oh, why are you worrying? Like, stop worrying. Worrying is a sin. What he's saying is you don't have to worry. Why would you be anxious about anything? Be content. Know that God is with you. He knows everything you need before you even ask. But does this mean we don't ask? By no means. Remember what Paul says literally right before this, leading into this passage. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So here's the secret of being content in need. is not only knowing that God is the giver of all things, but that we know exactly where we can go to ask for whatever we desire. See, that's different than what's con- commonly known in Christian circles as contentment, which is, well, I just don't ask God for anything because I don't need anything. That's the deadening of desires. That's not what God has for us. Our contentment isn't found in the, the idea that we don't ever want anything or we don't ever ask for anything or that in our need that we don't ask God, please provide, please help, please give me this. I, I, I desire this. It's found in knowing that I'm going to the only one who can fulfill those desires, the one who is able to do far more than I could ever ask or imagine, and the one who is a good father who didn't even withhold his own son from me, so how much more will he graciously give us all things? See, contentment is not just found in in just being thankful to God or being satisfied in our own. It's in knowing that I just went to the only one that matters, the one that could do anything about it. So I'm content because I know I've made my request known to God. He is a good father and he will not withhold any good gift from me. So whatever circumstance I am in, I can be content. That's the secret that Paul has found. To know that we have a good father. When Jesus says later in the Sermon on the Mount, which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good gifts to those, good things to those who ask him? Now look what happens. When I express that contentment when I find contentment not only in my abundance, but contentment in my need. And I, and that contentment is expressed by going to God and saying, God, I'm concerned. I don't have enough. I don't know how I'm going to pay this bill. I don't know how I'm going to get through this day. I need your help. As we do that, we express that contentment. Look what happens. It's expressed in my dependency on Christ for all things. And the more dependent I am on him, the closer I feel to him. Many of you have experienced the kind of contentment that comes from desperately crying out to God and saying, where else am I going to go? I have nowhere else to turn. I can't control any of this on my own. I can't, I can't deal with any of these things on my own. Like, you're the only one I can go to. And this source of peace that starts to grow in that, in the craziest and the wildest of circumstances, you experience peace. That's contentment. To know I'm at peace. Because I know who can help me. I've expressed all that to him. And I know he doesn't withhold a single good thing from me. And so I'm content in all circumstances. And by the way, as I'm doing that, guess what else happens? As I express my dependency on Christ and my desperate need for him, and I look around at others, guess what I see? Their desperate need for Christ also. And a heart of compassion grows for my neighbor because I see them as being in the same boat of saying, we both desperately need Christ. And so as I'm content in facing need, my love for God deepens and my love for my neighbor deepens. This is the secret of contentment. It happens 
not just with financial. We talk a lot about material or financial abundance or need, but those aren't the only things we deal with. If it's true there, how much more is it true in other areas like sickness and health? Like to be content in our health through Christ who strengthens us. Like think about that. If my abundant health, health, some of you right now are healthy. I just had a conversation this morning about how I, I felt like someone had asked if, if I was feeling, I asked them if they were feeling 100% and they said, it's been a long time since I felt 100%. And I thought about it for myself and I thought the last time, I think 100% like left me about 15 years ago. Like I, I genuinely I thought about that. I thought, oh, I remember feeling 100%. I was 30. That was it. Now, since then, it's like, you know, 98, 96, 92. Some days like 84. Some of you are like, I'd be happy to see 60, 60% what feels good, right? But some of you right now are the healthiest that you have ever been and will ever be. It's all downhill from here, right? <laughs> but the thing is, it's like, it's important to receive that gift of blessing with contentment, Christ-centered contentment, that I'm not chasing health in some kind of vain way so that I look a certain way, or to avoid death or aging. Rather, I'm receiving the gift of health. I'm being a steward of that gift by taking care of myself and eating properly and exercising and staying in good shape. But also like receiving that gift in Christ, the gift of health is then satisfying in Christ because he has given that to me for today. And if I'm satisfied in Christ, then I'll use my good health to be a blessing to others. I'll not hoard my energy. I'll use it to express my gratitude to God and love for others. But also to be content in sickness. Look what Paul says in 2 Corinthians. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this. He's talking about a thorn in his flesh. We don't know what that is, but it could have been a physical ailment. Whatever it was, he pleaded with the Lord that it should leave me. So make your request known to God. Lord, take this away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content, the word, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Do you hear what he's saying there? In those circumstances where I have my weaknesses are on display, when people are insulting me, when there are hardships, when there are persecutions, when there are calamities, when there is illness, I am content because I know the one who is with me and I know that when I am weak, he is strong and his power is on display in me. You want to see power on display, power of faith on display? Go to an oncology unit and watch people sit and take chemo for hours in a chair. And watch the ones who are praising God in the midst of it. That's power on display. That is power made perfect in weakness. It's not, Christian contentment is not just sucking up and saying, well, it could be worse and I don't deserve any better or anything like that. It's being at Peace, knowing that God is working. And, if, and I've already told him, God, take this cancer away from me. Take this illness away from me. I've asked him to do that. And I know there's nowhere else I can go but him. And if that is his will, he will take it away from me. He is able to do that. And I will unapologetically ask for that. But if not, I am content because I have made my request known to him. And he is God, and he is good, and he is with me. And I know that my weakness is an opportunity for his power to be displayed. So contentment does not mean just sucking it up. Contentment does not mean we don't grieve. You see Paul grieve all the time. Contentment does not mean we do not ask. We ask. It simply means that I am confident that he who began a good work in me is faithful, and he will bring it to completion in the day of Christ. No matter what my situation is, it means I trust God with all of my desires, all of my hopes, all of my dreams, all of my fears. I trust the Holy Spirit to work in me and to sanctify me and to expand my capacity for joy and peace. And the result of all of that, when whether I'm in abundance or in need, I have Christ and I am satisfied 
and I am fulfilled, and I am at peace. Contentment in the chemo chair breeds a deeper love of God than most things I can imagine. Contentment at the graveside, contentment in the unemployment line, contentment as you're of a parent who is wringing their hands over a child who has gone wayward, saying, I have pleaded with God to rescue them. That's all I can do. And all of that develops a deeper dependency on God and a deeper compassion for those around us. And it's a gift. And Paul says it's life itself. Because ultimately Paul's contentment is found in when he said earlier in Philippians, to live as Christ and to die as gain. Church, contentment in life is not brought about by having the most experiences or by measuring the life, the life in your days rather than the days of your life. It's not brought about by having a perfect life and exactly achieving everything that you wanted so that you can look back someday and be satisfied by that. It is found in Christ. Are you alive today? Is Christ with you? Then you have everything you need to live a life of eternal significance. I told you that I've always struggled with contentment. It's because I just wanted my life to matter. I used to tell Lauren all the time, like, I don't want to waste my life. I want to get to the end of my life and say that mattered. And when I was younger, I thought that meant being the pastor of some big church or being known or writing books. And I was surrounded by people who, was doing, who were doing those things. And I had lots of people looking at me and saying, well, why aren't you doing those things? Like, you should be doing those things. And, and so I kept tra- chasing and trying and finding, trying to find those things that would fulfill me, those things that would make me say, this life matters. And what God did to me was he broke me and left Lauren and me living in an RV, traveling around the country with nowhere to go, nobody who wanted us, and no idea what was next. And little by little, what God did for me in that was he would bring people into our path to love and to be faithful to and to minister to. Not people who could go to our church, not people who could share a testimony about anything, but we would go into a campground and there would be a family who had just moved across the country to find for a job only to find out the job wasn't there and now they have no money and nothing to eat and to be able to say, how can we, how can we help you? Or to find a, a group of homeless young adults or Lauren could make food for them, or to come into a campground and encourage a young mom. And what God showed me over that time during that sabbatical was all the things that I thought mattered, things that the world would say mattered, were meaningless. What mattered was every moment being faithful in the situation that was right in front of me. And what I realized was that God didn't want me to deaden my desires for not wanting to waste my life. He wanted to fan that flame. Don't waste your life. Use it for the kingdom. Don't ever settle for something less. Don't settle for just a plain life of following Jesus. There's no such thing. Pour your whole heart and soul into it. And what the Holy Spirit is saying to me in all that is, do all that, fan that flame, live your life, and pour it all into the person that's right in front of you. And be faithful in the small things and I will give you greater things. Some of you know that when we moved here, it was a strange fit. Some of you think that's an obvious, that's obvious from the beginning. I don't know why you have to explain that. But we're Western missionaries. I just told you that our idea of a vacation is going to the most densely populated area we can possibly find and walk around seas of people. Right? Like, so we are from city. We are from the West. We are missionaries. I'm not an established pastor of an established church. Like, that's not who I am. On paper, this makes no sense. 
And a couple of years into me being here, I had friends ask, they were like, so what is it like? Like, I, like none of us thought you were going to last there because my whole life I've been chasing things. And none of my friends, like the over under on me was like three months here. It's reality. There's actually, you could have betted on it, bet on it. It would have been great. Um, don't bet, kids. And I remember saying to one of my friends, he said, so how are you doing? And I said, honestly, like on paper, I could not imagine, like there's so many things that I do on a daily basis that are not in my wiring, not in my gifting. And there are many, there are plenty of people that tell me how terrible I am at some of those things. And yet I said, I've never been more content in my life. I, you gotta understand, for me, for years, on a weekly basis, multiple times a week, I would look for other things. Even when I was planting a church, I'd be like, whoa, what's going on? Oh, and if somebody contacted me and said, hey, there's this church in Vancouver. Oh, I like, you know, Vancouver sounds fun. Like, oh, there's a church in Ocala, Florida. Like, okay, that's interesting. I don't know. Like, and I would just do that. You know how many times in nine years of being here that I've done that? Zero. Nine years of feeling, even with all the ups and downs, that we've been through together of just total contentment. And the source of that is every day getting up and saying, Jesus, are you with me? What else do I need? And when I look back on those nine years, this is just my own personal testimony. This isn't what I was, this was not supposed to be the last point, but it is now. This is my personal testimony to you. If you are a person who is wired to chase and to find those things that will fulfill you, let me tell you something. You will only find it in Christ. And for nine years, now I look back and I am moved that God would be so kind to me that he would just say, just be faithful. Each week, preach the word. Each week, love the person that's in front of you. Meet with the person that needs to meet. Reach out to the person that I lay on, your hand, lay on you to reach out to. And I've not been perfect in that by any stretch, but every week to just do that every week. And when I look back on that, I think, what a gift. Because I cannot imagine a better use of nine years of my life. And just so you know, this is not leading into announcement that I'm now retiring or anything. Like, I, I have no interest in going anywhere. I don't want to, like, I, I have no interest. I am content. And I'm telling you that Jay of 10, 12 years ago would not have even known what that meant to be content. But my passion for the gospel and to see it take root in people's lives and for me to, like, continue to be sanctified and to move forward is not lessened. It's been deepened in that contentment. So if you are wired to chase, let me just tell you, start by chasing Christ right now in front of you. Start there and just do that. And bit by bit, what you will find is a life of meaning and value. And if you're the type of person that's wired to be more deadened to those things and just be like, yeah, that's why I just don't want anything, open your heart up to what Christ has for you. See every moment as an opportunity to express faithfulness and to receive these incredible blessings that he has for you. Don't deaden yourself. Don't fool yourself into thinking that there'll be something else out there. Christ is who will satisfy. You can do all things through him who strengthens you. You can handle any circumstance through him who strengthens you. You can be in any state. You can live in any place. You can work in any job. You can be in any marriage. You can parent any child through him who strengthens you. Find your contentment here in your life. And then when it is over, you will have contentment in your death because to die is gain. And you'll meet Jesus and he will not ask you about all the big things the world might ask you. He will ask if you've been faithful and we'll see a life of small acts of faithfulness that add up to big things. And he'll say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into my rest. 
and be content forever. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of contentment. Thank you, God, that it isn't something that's just some fairy tale that's out there. And that it's not found in finding the right circumstances or making the right choices or, or choosing the right road as if you are waiting in the right city for us or the right job for us and you're just waiting there for us. You are not. You are with us right now. And our capacity to experience being satisfied and fulfilled, full of joy and full of peace is found in our abiding in you. And Lord, as we abide in you, I pray you would stoke those fires of our faith and our passion for the gospel, that we would seek the kingdom first, that we would pursue every abundant life that you have for us, to pursue it all, and also to do so in a satisfied way, knowing that you are the giver of all good gifts. Lord, I pray that this would not just stay in our heads but it would move out into our lives. We would imagine what kind of spouses would we be? What kinds of friends would we be? What kind of workers would we be? What kind of neighbors would we be if we were fueled by a passion for you and the total contentment of knowing you are God, you are good, you hold all things together, and you are faithful. Let us be those kinds of people for your glory and our joy. Amen.